So let's begin with this. Um, after October 1st, or sometime close thereafter, um, a boy, a little boy or a little girl is going to say, Grandpa, <laughs> you like the sound of it so far? Yeah, but if, if my grandchild can talk at one or two weeks, <laughs> I was the get future of my family is secured. <laughs> <laughs> No, I said he'd be born in one or two weeks. <laughs> Not that he could talk. And he says, Grandpa, a lot of people seem to know you. What is it you did? What will you tell him or her? I will explain what I did with my life. I will say, you know, I was, uh, after I grew up and went to law school and taught for a while, I went into public service, and I will explain what it was. And after I left being president, I got a chance to try something entirely new and different. And I wasn't term limited, so I got to do it a little longer. <laughs> Thanks to my health being saved by a lot of people. And um, I will tell my grandson or granddaughter why I did it and why I think it was worthwhile. And where will you put CGI? Oh, way up there. It's, it's made a big difference. You know, it's, it's also, I think, came along at the right time, a time when uh, information technology and kind of more global consciousness made these kind of partnerships and networks possible and, and desirable, even necessary. So I, I, it's really made a big difference. Is philanthropy changing? Mm -hmm. Every day, it's getting better. It's, it's changing, and it's get, becoming more effective all the time, I believe. Because uh, first, we've learned some big things. We've learned what philanthropy can accomplish and what it cannot accomplish unless it's also partnered with a private sector <clears throat> operation trying to actually make a living in the market. That's always more sustainable. And what it needs government for. And have the, you know the best partnerships are ones that are at least have a supportive government and involve philanthropy and the private sector and the business sector, and that's changed. And I just think we also have a lot more information on what works and how it works. So it's exciting. You're much more likely to be able to hit your targets if you do the things that we know we have to do. What's been the most difficult? doing things that require either a lot of money or a government to change its policy. For example, I'm disappointed that the Caribbean is not already completely electrified by solar and wind and biomass and geothermal. I mean, they got it. It's, it's you know, it, everything that's big takes longer than you think it should. Why is Haiti so hard? Because from its founding, it was threatened by abuse from outsiders, which then was reflected in abuse from insiders, and then neglect from outsiders, from its neighbors and friends for a long time. And after a pattern of abuse and neglect from outsiders very often breeds abuse and neglect from inside. And the institutions that have to rebuild, be rebuilt in some places after a natural calamity, for example, uh, didn't really exist in many of sectors of Haitian life. And the political system was organized to try to keep anybody from getting too much power in reaction to what happened under the Duvaliers. But then it became difficult to make decisions, except for a brief period after the earthquake when then President Preval had virtually free writ. He could do, the parliament gave him the permission to do anything that was not explicitly forbidden by the Constitution. But except for that, it, because of their history, they, the, the government action tends to be slower than you wish. Now, this government that's there now, under <clears throat> President Martelli and Prime Minister Malta, is the most decisive government we've had 
on particularly on domestic, economic, and social issues. So we've gotten quite a lot done, but they're still sort of at odds with the parliament. The parliament's not fully constituted. <coughs> the scheduling of elections is still open. Um, so I would say of various kinds of political dysfunction and the absence of systems that you and I take for granted. I ask all of these questions because we're here at CGI, but also uh, James Bennett <coughs> interviewed you, said in a profile for the Atlantic magazine, overall Bill Clinton has conducted the most energetic, high-profile post-presidency since at least Theodore Roosevelt, pouring himself into philanthropic, <laughs> political, and yes, money-making ventures. But besides supporting his wife as she worked as a senator, secretary of state, and once in future presidential candidate, he has made his most unconventional contribution to the Clinton Global Initiative. That's why I ask about this. Um, has the idea of not just talking but doing worked out as well as you expected? Oh, yeah. Even when what we do doesn't work, it's better than not talking and not doing it. <laughs> I mean, uh, you know, for a guy that's uttered as many words as I have and yeah. loves speech and loves political speech. Really? <laughs> I still think what you do is more important. And what you say is credible in direct relationship to what you do and what you have done and what you're going to do. I think ideas matter greatly but can only have impact if you can turn them into action. So, yeah, I, I love this. But it's how I try to run the other part of my foundation, too. I think. You know, we've done some other pretty big things, having over half the people on Earth alive who have AIDS <clears throat> because they're eligible for drugs off our contract that are the least expensive, high-quality drugs in the world. That's a pretty important deal. And making uh, this agreement we made in the Alliance for a Healthier Generation that's reduced the caloric content of drinks shipped to schools by 90%. That's a pretty big deal. That's a couple pounds a year for all these kids who are struggling with their weight around our country. For you, what is the biggest misconception about the Clinton presidency? I don't know. They're about to get it right now, according <laughs> to all these surveys. <laughs> <laughs> but I think that I think most people underappreciate the level of extreme um, partisanship that took hold in '94. Even greater than it's been for the. I wouldn't say greater, but it, you know, nobody's accused him of murder yet, as far as I know. I mean, it was pretty rough back then, and the kind of the way the institutions of American life, including the way the media covered politics, was uh, basically rigged, uh, designed. Rigged sounds unsavory. Designed to promote conflict over cooperation to an extent that was, you know, not healthy for our country. But has that gotten worse or better? Or well, it's the, the politics, I think, by parties are probably even more polarized yeah. than they were then. Um, because the people have been polarized in part by being balkanized. Now, part of it is congressional reapportionment and all that, but part of it goes way beyond that. I mean, if you, uh, you look at these Pew studies, which show that uh, we want to be around physically and virtually. That is, with our television viewing, our internet viewing, people who agree with us. And we don't much care to spend any time with people who don't. Meaning we and, like to hit, listen to and hear people who have yeah, the same opinion we I, I do. tell everybody all the time, America's made such progress. We're less racist, sexist, and homophobic than we used to be. We just don't want to be around anybody who disagrees with us. <laughs> and... Uh, yeah. Of course, that's what all these surveys show, and that's the, wor that's the very worst thing we can do because there is, you know, we could fill this room with the social science research which proves that groups make better decisions than geniuses acting alone, and that diverse groups who actually disagree bring different perspectives, different experiences, and debate issues, but they debate it with the purpose of coming to an agreement, make better decisions than a small group of like-minded people, no matter how smart they are. The only thing that makes worse decisions are diverse groups who have in mind that they must never make a decision unless they get everything they want. 
Now that's worse than letting a small group of people act alone. But we, there's just, that's what's, it's, it's hurting us. It may be very good for people who are financing all this polarization who don't basically want anything to happen. But if you believe the country needs a government to get the show on the road, uh, and that all this political polarization is a kind of a bummer and basically involves majoring in the minors at a time when there are huge challenges facing America at home and abroad, it'd be better if we uh, got together more. Uh, let's talk about that. Uh, looking at the challenge from ISIS today, uh, is the president doing it about right, or do you believe uh, we need more different uh, weapons to challenge <coughs> ISIS? And I mean by that... Uh, diplomatic. I understand. Um, um, well, I think there, you, you've seen a blizzard of diplomatic efforts in the last few weeks. I think the strategy involving, um, of involving the Sunni um, tribal leaders and other moderates in the western part of Iraq, first in the government, which our country pushed for, and I'm proud of them. That was the right thing to do. <coughs> and then in the fight against ISIS, has a chance to prevail. I think it is correct <coughs> that we should not be directly involved in a land war in Iraq. I think the I think it's enough to send. We we had to have some people on the ground there to do intelligence work and other things, but I think. And they are in harm's way. They are in harm's <coughs> way. But they're not carrying the brunt of the battle. And I think they, um, they're necessary to make the air war and the other things work. Uh, it's got a chance to succeed. It, you always have a chance to win. I, I was thinking because I just saw General McChrystal on that last commitment. That surge <coughs> in Iraq worked when I didn't think it would. Mm -hmm. I admit. Because? Because... The tribal leaders, the Sunni tribal leaders, were willing to take a stand against al-Qaeda in Iraq. Mm -hmm. They were willing to take a stand against their own people being murdered and beheaded and all that sort of stuff. And you can't beat somebody with nobody in a fight. It's, it's, you've got to have somebody to back because it's their fight. And if you try to make it your fight, you're like playing an away game. And when you get tired and go home, all they have to do is survive. You don't even, yeah. They don't even have to win. And you can't do it alone, A, because you have to have somebody there. That's correct. Uh, whose so fight I, is as important as it is to anybody. Yeah, so I think this has a chance to succeed. And uh, I also believe that the airstrikes were important that had been conducted because of the beheadings. I think you just you at least have to let people know there's a price to pay for that without being sucked into what they want, which is to get you on the ground in large yeah, numbers yeah. so they can kill more of you and cost you a lot of money and, and make people think that their fight is against the United States instead of against more moderate, decent Iraqis. But what if it's not enough? Is ISIS and radical... Ter fundamentalist terrorism, such a threat to us that if in the end it requires American combat troops in the interest of our national security, that's a decision the president has to make. It's a decision he has to make. I think it highly unlikely that <coughs> he will have to make that decision because he'll have to discount against whatever good we could do sending troops there the problems that we know will happen. Will we be interrupting and stunning the growth of what has the chance to be the first truly inclusive Iraqi government uh, and making the fight about us? I mean, there are lots of there are reasons that he didn't do that that I think are quite sound. And, um, I'd have, and you'd have to know more about the threat to the United States from ISIS than I know now, since I'm not in the intelligence loop. I don't know what else is going on, but... But you would argue, wouldn't you, that an Islamic State, as conceived by ISIS, is unacceptable? It would be a bad thing, yeah. If, it, if they took over massive swath of Syria and a massive swath of Iraq and mm -hmm. made a new state that was 
basically capable of robbing billions of dollars from banks and otherwise stealing money and and running a it, if it became basically a terror syndicate it would be a bad thing if they wanted to hurt us or destabilize our friends and neighbors but I think that we have a task now it has been defined it may be achievable and I think that as soon as somebody sets on a policy today in today's rapidly evolving media involvement. I'm going to be interested to see what you say to about Gina McCarthy out there to talk about the EPA exactly. policy. As soon as somebody sets on a policy, particularly in foreign policy, and particularly if there, a bullet's going to be fired or a bomb's going to be dropped, people then start asking, well, okay, what if this fails? Then what new terrible thing will have to be done? I think we need to give this a chance to succeed. And then if it doesn't, we need to look at the facts on the ground. At the moment, it doesn't. I think the president's strategy has a chance to succeed, and we should give it a chance to do so. And if it doesn't, you have to jump over that bridge when you get to it. Yeah, based on why it doesn't succeed and what the facts on the ground are then and what the realistic appreciation of the threat to our, our people is and our allies are then. Let's assume that uh, you were advising a presidential candidate. <laughs> That's a heavy assumption. Yes, it is. <laughs> My advice has sometimes been welcome and sometimes <laughs> not. Sometimes right and sometimes not. <laughs> what would you suggest, thinking about America today, is the narrative, the imperative theme about what's essential for us to go forward as a nation? What would the be? recovery of our capacity to provide a society that offers equal opportunity and the possibility of shared prosperity an expanding middle class with poor people having a reasonable chance to work their way into it. Uh, and a much more vigorous orientation toward the future, that is making future-related investments like a modern electrical grid, a, a, a national uh, network of a wireless network where the computer download speeds are comparable to South Korea. Right now, that burden of creating a national network is being borne by Google. They, they pick 45 communities, and exactly. they're going to give us globally competitive it, download right. speeds in those communities. That's great. But the truth is, as Hillary learned as a senator from New York, sometimes the people that can profit most economically immediately from rapid access, access to rapid download uh, broadband are, are in rural areas small towns and rural areas. Because it we, connects them in a different yeah. series of ways yeah. to a broader I'll never world. forget she helped us. She found this guy that was making fishing poles. and He quadrupled his employee base <laughs> and quadrupled his business, and 100% yeah. of the poles yeah. were sold in Norway, and he was in a small town in upstate New York. If it hadn't been for the Internet, that couldn't have happened. So they need that. So I, I think that you, know, you need a policy that puts us in the future business. Same thing with research and development on... on uh, energy areas and in biotechnology areas. I think that, that I think America's really well positioned for the future. Do I, you I, believe I know it's tough, but we there are very few countries in the world have anything like the positioning we have to grow our economy in a broad based way for the future. But we gotta do it. Are presidential elections always decided on the future or are they often or could they be a referendum on the past, whether it's the past of the Obama administration or the past of the Clinton administration? I think people think, you know, I think what happened in the past is relevant insofar as it's an indication of what might happen in the future. And I use the word might advisedly. Mm -hmm. But uh, by and large, almost all elections are about the future. People forget and politicians convince, and the apparatus covering politics forgets that elections are giant job interviews. 
and the election for president is the grandest job interview on the planet. And when you show up for a job, the, the difference is if you decided to retire and I want to interview for your job. Please don't. I won't. I don't, if I, I don't want you to retire, but I'm trying to make a point here. I've watched you for years. I've got an idea for what this show is and right. what it is, right? But if you were running for president. Yeah. Looking better all the time. Yeah. You might have some ideas from watching me or George W. Bush or George H.W. Yeah. Bush or Barack Obama. But you know, one of the burdens of running for president is you're actually trying to define the job for the people that are going to decide whether to hire you or not. So it's the most interesting job interview. That is, you know there are certain things that you have to do, no matter whether you're Republican or Democrat or whatever. But you, every four years, somebody stands up and says, I want this job, and if you give it to me, this is what I'll try to do with it. And then if you're the person making the hiring decision, you have to assess your, you and your family's condition, the condition of your community, the condition of your neighbors around America, how we're doing with the rest of the world. How did this guy do defining the job? Then you've got to say, wonder if he or she can do that. You know, it, it sounds good. Wonder if they got the juice mm -hmm. to do it. And then... And there's no way you can know because they've never done anything no, comparable. No, you got some indication... As a governor or as a business. Yeah. It, it matters. It, it is a good indicator, but it's not definitive. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, there's something else we've learned, all of us in the last 20, 30 years, with the dispersal of power because of information technology and other things, it is even more likely than it used to be that there will be something you didn't think about in the election that will happen. Al Gore and George W. Bush had all those fervent debates. Nobody asked either one of them, what are you going to do when the World Trade Center comes yeah, exactly. down? When the Pentagon's bombed. So you have to say, how will this person handle the incoming fire? That's it. That's what it's about. Okay, but let me just come back to what about the narrative. Let's suppose that, uh, what do you think are the five most important things that has to be done? Thinking of the narrative you suggested uh, in the first 100 days of a new presidency. In terms of what you said about the middle class and what you terms of what you have said about our image in the world. Well, first on the home front, we need a table plan that has the prospect of restoring more rapid growth that actually generates jobs, raises incomes, and gives poor people a chance to work their way from poverty into the middle class. I think that's really important. Yeah. I think um, the most likely way to do that is flowing investments into areas that we know will create a lot of jobs and that simultaneously will change the job mix. In other words, here's something that almost no Americans noticed. Last six months, for the first time in these quarterly job reports, yeah. about 40% of the new jobs have been in higher wage categories. Right. That's the first time that's happened since 2000. And on the other hand, we still are losing more small businesses than we're gaining. That's atypical for America, but it's been happening since the crash. So we need a strategy to deal with that. I, that's the first thing. Uh, I think the most reasonable, easy, low-hanging fruit targets are a revived effort in the energy area, and particularly in making all these buildings in America more efficient. Infrastructure. Yeah, and, yeah. and then other kinds of infrastructure, but you get some 8,000 jobs for every billion dollars you spend in, in the building retrofit business. You lower everybody's utility rate. It's a big deal. I think uh, that's the first thing. I think secondly, continuing to work on the health care system is important because it, the four-year hiatus we've had in health care inflation, we've got to keep it going. And... I don't care what anybody says, this, the federal health care law that expanded Medicaid to the working people with low incomes and their kids 
was a big boon. In Arkansas, my state, which did it, we, had the, we ranked first in the country. We did it on a bipartisan basis. First in the country in the reduction of people without health insurance. And the projected insurance premiums in Arkansas this year by Blue Cross is, are either flat or down 2%. Next door in Louisiana, where they talked about how this was a socialist plot that would bankrupt the state of Louisiana and all that, they didn't do it. They paid for us to do it, and their projected Blue Cross increase is 18.5%. Why? Because they have uncompensated care, rural hospitals are threatened, urban hospitals are threatened. I would keep this cost containment, change of care delivery thing down, and then you gotta, do, you gotta keep working on education and reform the student loan problem and figure out a way to deliver either online or in person much more affordable uh, higher education and we have to erase, totally erase the difference between technical and academic education. Right. Those, want, you asked me, that, those no, are well, the that's exactly that what I wanted. Some of that was, you know, you, I, that's exactly what I wanted to hear because we, too often we talk about big ideas which are important, but as you say, it's important to have small. And we should bring the money home. The corporate money that's been lodged overseas can be brought home. The corporations have told us how to do it. Whether we like it or not, <laughs> this inversion, this is their money. And we are going to have to have a more corporate, uh, competitive corporate tax system. So I close with this. Uh, there is no one I know in politics, from the left, the right, Republican, Democrat, male or female, that doesn't say Bill Clinton is the best political animal that's ever been <laughs> in American politics, and no. certainly in for as long as they can remember. Tell me what you think that's about. Why does everybody have that opinion of you as a political person? Well, some of the people who refer to me as an animal think I should be in a zoo. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And some of them acted as if I actually was in a zoo the whole time. <laughs> no, I think, uh, look, I don't know if it's true or not, but to be really good at this, you got to like people. You gotta like policy. And you gotta like politics. You gotta have a pain threshold. You have to understand there's a reason this is a contact sport. <laughs> and and yet, there gotta be some things you won't do to be good at it. The framers set us up to minimize the possibility of abuse of power, but they knew it was a possibility. So uh, I don't know why other people think that. Maybe, I, I don't know. But I know why I think it, if I am any good at this, I know why I think. I was the last, uh, I was part of the last generation of Americans born without a television. I don't mean to be disrespectful, I love to watch you on TV, but <laughs> my, what, I was almost 10 when I got a TV. Yeah. First two things I watched were the Democrat and Republican conventions in 1956. I was a ten, you know, almost ten year old kid. I was fascinated by it, yeah. and so I've always liked people. I've always liked politics, but I love policy. And but I I grew up in a storytelling age. I grew up where people taught me to pay attention to other people. I grew up by, raised by parents and grandparents, and an extended family who believed that everyone had a story and that we all were entitled to equal dignity and respect. And so when you get older, you probably talk too much, but when you're a kid in a talking family that a lot of smart people, even though they didn't have education, they were really smart, you have to prove you can listen to a story before you can tell one. And I really believe it all started there. Mm -hmm. I believe that being taught that people without regard to their income, race, education, leveling, or standing are equal in the eyes of God and therefore should be equal in your eyes and should be treated with respect and they all have a story and you should listen to their story before you tell one. I think that simple set of lessons led directly to where I'm sitting today. Mm -hmm. uh, I would do whether, what I do whether there was a television or not simply yeah. because it's the love of the idea of conversation, which I understood and developed from the same kind of beginning. Yeah, well, you and I grew up the same. But the reason I like your program is 
look, I, we should make disclosure. Charlie and I have spent time off the screen. We are, have a friendly relationship. We played some golf together. But the thing I like is I, I pretty much know kind of your political views and your preferences and all that. But you interview everybody the same. And you ask hard questions just like you threw a few zingers at me, but you always give people the chance to tell their story. You never go into an interview, or if you do, you don't ever give the appearance that you go to the interview with the purpose of really just screwing the person you're interviewing, you know, <laughs> and sticking to them so that you can get higher ratings and you can do that. Nobody gets that. I think it's important that we recover that again. In, the con in, in, in political discourse, there's plenty of room for differences, but I, I think we've got to recover that. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Let me, um, first of all, thank you guys for coming here uh, to talk about uh, one of the most important issues of our time. And, and let me just begin um, with all of you. What do you, what's, what do you hope to achieve in this summit? and what's taking place here in New York? Uh, and and what, do you, what will you be disappointed if you don't achieve? Well, from, from my perspective, I think what's happening here in New York, I mean, starting with the march yesterday, yeah. is just to raise awareness. Because I, I think the Are you stunned by the numbers? Well, I, I was there on 84th Street. I was pretty stunned just trying to get into the, <laughs> uh, to the march myself. But uh, I was stunned by everything, the, the numbers, the traffic, everything that was going on in New York mm -hmm. on Sunday. But I think the biggest issue we have in the United States from a public policy perspective is that the politicians keep hearing from their pollsters that less than 1% of the American public cares about climate change, that it's you know, way down in double digits on the list. And, um, and as long as it's way down there, then the politicians won't act mm -hmm. in a way to solve the problem. So uh, f from, from my perspective, I just think that raising awareness is the most important thing at this point. Thanks, Charlie, for having me. Um, I, I uh, agree with my utility colleague, um, which you don't often hear from yeah, me. Right. This, um, this is being taped. Uh, <laughs> hopefully limited audience here. Uh, you know, the most important thing for me is that people get comfortable understanding that climate change actions will actually be not just good for the world and for our families and our kids, but they're going to be good for an economy. Mm -hmm. You cannot have uh, a, a sustainable economy without making that part and parcel with a low energy, uh, a low carbon energy strategy. Mm -hmm. And the worst thing that we can see ever happen is nothing on climate change. Mm -hmm. uh, the costs of that are immeasurable to all of us, where climate actions are that, that can do things that are both good for our environment and for the economy are at our fingertips, and we have to grab those. Now's the time. Charlie, I see a tipping point. I always see the glass That's exactly what I was going to ask. But I see a tipping point here. Uh, I'm encouraged by over 300,000 people on the streets of New York, millions of people around the world out there for climate. I'm encouraged by what you're seeing today in the papers, funds, pension funds, uh, insurance companies, big corporations, divesting from fossil fuels, investing into renewables, and moving towards a low carbon economy. And I'm encouraged about 120 heads of state in New York as of tomorrow. We had 90 in Copenhagen for COP15. We have 120 here. So what I see is this big, giant, public-private partnership on which you have all three ingredients necessary to start the movement towards a low-carbon economy. OK, what ought to be the agenda to do that? Linking economics and environment. Climate change and mitigating its impact is the most impressive, important, economic opportunity of our times, perhaps of humanity. I believe we're leaving behind 200 years of industrial revolution. The steam out of that engine is out. We didn't leave the Stone Age because we ran out of stones, but because we went on to something better. <laughs> and the low carbon economy is something much better. So linking the economy and the environment is a future. Will you add to that? 
Well, the, the what I would say is that it's time for people to actually develop the strategies for moving forward. We've talked a lot about goals that need to happen. The actions are in front of us. You know, that's why President Obama put out a climate action plan, not a goal plan. Uh, we have goals and we want to be aggressive, but we know how to get there as well. Where is the resistance? Um, you know, the resistance, I think, for years has been that we've been projecting that the climate will be a problem in the future, and we have been trying to convince people that it's a global solution that's necessary, which disempowered people from taking action. What's happened in the meantime is the world has started to change. We're in an energy transformation. In other words, right they can now. see what's happening. They can see what's happening. The impacts are now. We're documenting, not projecting them. And we can also see that solutions are here. In the United States, states and, and cities, they're here to Today. They're making announcements about things they're doing because they've been doing them and it's good for them. You know, you have cities actually saving money from efficiency programs so they can hire teachers and they can hire firemen. These are the things you actually want to do. And so they see the future as being in front of them and they see it as being brighter because they're, they're looking at climate change. They're uh, afraid of doing nothing and it's time to change. Um, earlier this year, Bill, uh, Bill McKibben, the environmentalist and co-founder of the anti-carbon group 350.org, uh, wrote this in Rolling Stone. He said, in a rational world, policymakers would have heeded scientists when they first sounded the alarm 25 years ago. But in this world, reason has won the argument, has so far lost the fight. That's politics? I, I think that's fear-mongering. I think the, the fight that was held a few years ago in the U.S. Congress to pass comprehensive carbon change legislation right. I mean, the opposition was led by climate change deniers, but I don't believe for a second that the American public doesn't believe the climate's changing. All you have to do is go outside mm -hmm. and see that the climate is changing. But where I think that they won the argument that day was by saying, we don't have the technology. It would be economically ruinous to do something about climate change. It will destroy jobs. And now, uh, four or five years later, jobs are being created in the clean energy sector every day. But we have to keep in mind in the question that uh, the administrator answered is, where is the resistance? The resistance is that people don't understand that the primary energy business worldwide is a $6 trillion a year business. Mm -hmm. And the solutions for the future are not the way energy is delivered today. So there's people representing $6 trillion of economic interest that want to protect the status quo. Gina, what happened to the, when the president, I guess it was in June, announced uh, the clean, what was it, the clean power? Clean Power Plan. Yeah, he, he put together a climate action plan. And in June, EPA released our Clean right. Power Plan, which is basically to take a look at the harmful carbon pollution that's coming from the, the fossil fuel-fired energy generators. And what's been the response since you those. released the plan? Well, you know, we did the plan recognizing that states have already done a lot of things that will get them there. And we focused on making it as flexible as possible and setting some, some aggressive goals. Mm -hmm. We're looking at reducing carbon pollution by 30% by 2030. Uh, over uh, That's from 2005 levels. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the conversation has actually been very good. We listen to states. Yeah. We talk to the utilities. Yeah. The conversations is great. It's, it's generating a lot of energy. But I think the most important thing the president did was speak with definition. You know, he stood up and said, climate's happening. He's not discussing that. The science is there. And he told us that there was a moral obligation to act. And the worst thing he could do is nothing. And so we are moving forward. And I think, I believe that dynamics have changed. I think Bill should be a little bit excited about yesterday and excited about the change. And people care about this and they're doing something. Businesses can't afford to have their head in the sand. They cannot be ostrich-like. Are you seeing more collaboration because of the imperative uh, of a policy between government and business? Well, I think, the, to be frank, Charlie, I think business's attitude towards government and climate change right now is that nothing, certainly nothing's coming out of Washington this time soon. So, 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 so without so. Washington, we have to take the bull by the horns? Yeah, well, that the business needs to make a compact with the American people ah. uh, uh, to, do, to, to do something. And um, you don't, when you deal with other CEOs, as I do, there's no CEO that denies climate change, because in business, we deal with facts. Exactly. And so uh, uh, I've never heard a CEO, they'd be laughed out of the room if they said, so every business is dealing with it. And I think what you're seeing right now is 
more and more CEOs uh, coming into major corporations, much bigger corporations than, than mine, that, that not only know that doing something about the climate is essential to the future of their business, but, they, but they're, you know, as parents, and they're feeling it not only intellectually, but in their heart. And I, I think you actually face a prospect right now, in the United States at least, that we could have the first business-led social movement. You know, usually business is a lagging indicator yeah, for social right. change. Uh, so maybe I'm too optimistic. Maybe it's just the seat I sit in. But I'm very optimistic about the role that business has to play. Can you imagine that? I can imagine that. I can believe in that. And I think that this is a revolution that would stand for business to lead it the mm -hmm. way that NRG and others are doing it. But I would say that this is an opportunity for the business, not only the global businesses that we think of often, but even for the small family business that owns a tractor trailer, for example. Right. Mm -hmm. We've got 3.5 million tractor trailers here in the U.S. They have an average gas mileage of five to six miles per gallon. Mm -hmm. Today, Carbon War Room launched a website called truckingefficiency.org, third-party vetting of over 70 technologies that are off the shelf, available today, that will reduce your gas consumption by 40%. That family is paying $70,000 for fuel a year. Technologies today can give them a 40% rebate on the fuel bill. That's the revolution that we need. The, take China. Everybody who goes to China, everybody who watches um, television and sees China understands the pollution problem they have. Uh, they, on the hand, other hand, know that they need to continue projecting themselves ahead in terms of creating jobs uh, and raising their economic development, which has been slowing down. Uh, how are they responding? Fantastically. Let's take China. Mm -hmm. They installed 10 gigawatts of solar last year. They're installing 14 gigawatts of solar this year. They are responsible, almost single-handedly, but I'd like to have Dave come in on this, for reducing the price of solar by about 80% since 2009 or 2010. But if you look at what they're doing and they're embedding in their third five-year plan, which goes into action as of January of 2016, it's all about moving towards a low-carbon economy. I believe China is seeing in the advancement in that direction, the opportunity to catch up with the West by at least 25 years. Well, I think when you talk about China, the 800-pound the, the gorilla in the room is China's coal plants because, right. um, you know, the average age of a coal plant in the United States is 40 years old. And thus, by the year 2050, which is a, a year that the scientists have said is important, almost virtually all the coal plants in the United States will be retired one way or the other. Uh, and no one's building new coal plants in the United States. So, but China, the average age of a coal plant is less than 10 years. So there is one technological innovation that we need, and it goes by the unsexy name of post-combustion carbon capture. And there's a, 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 because we need to retrofit all the coal plants in China, because they're not going to turn them off. And mm -hmm. so, so that's the, if you said to me, David, what's the one technology that we have to deploy at scale and at a low cost, that's it. And uh, you know we're doing a project in the United States. Other people are doing it. So I think that's the greatest contribution we can make in U.S. business is develop that technology and then share it with China and India and the other people who are building uh, new coal plants. Hmm. Charlie, I think the important thing to remember about China is they're not only interested in, in what the U.S. and others are doing on climate change, and I think the president sends a signal when we go out domestically as strongly as we have. But they're worried about air quality in general. I mean, that is a big problem for them. It's a health issue. The interesting issue. thing is that when you go after carbon, all of those other pollutants that are causing them the problem begin to get captured as well. And so if they think about this as a strategy for the public health of, of the people in China, not just how they build their, their economy in ways that will continue to be globally competitive, they've got to come up with a solution that grabs all of that. And if you look at the history of EPA, we've been regulating these pollutants, as people can tell who travel and come back here and see the sun again. 
and really want to have a nice, healthy breath of, of clean air, they can see that we have reduced pollution in this country by 70 percent, while the GDP has tripled. To, ha to continue to have this false dichotomy be the, between the economy and the environment is what has taken so long. But it's not the history of how we've gotten there. You know, you can have it, have it both ways. And I think, in fact, in order to have a really sustainable economy, you have to have it both ways. Why do these international conferences seem to not reach their desired goal, whether it's Copenhagen or whether it's Mexico or wherever it might be? What's the conflict? It takes a much longer time to arrive at a consensus, and today we have a method of reaching international agreements, which is based on the proposition that every country must agree in order to move forward. And so, of course, we have some laggards, and because of the laggards, we bring down our aspirational goals to a point where what we deliver is often a very mediocre result. Someday, that will change. But with respect to international negotiations, what the administrator and the U.S. <laughs> are doing here, yes. as of three or four months ago, with the support for the first time ever of the Supreme Court, which is an important element. Many times. Many times. <laughs> Many times. What China is doing, if we can get Prime Minister Moody in India to redo his energy sector as a way to spur their economy in India, which they need to do, you would have the U.S., China, and India arrive next year in Paris come December COP21 with very differentiated positions with what they have been having in the past. And that would allow for an agreement. And you said, Charlie, at the beginning of this that business cannot have its head in the ground, did you right. say? What business needs is clear signals ahead. Yeah. Business needs political figures to have the courage to say, this is a way to a low carbon economy, and they will invest accordingly and make a mint out of it. We hope so. So as we close, tell me, each of you, I mean, what gives you <sighs> most hope and what do you worry about most in the effort to change the dynamic of our climate environment? So I get to go first. Well, well, I, <laughs> what, I, you know, what, what gives me hope, uh, again, speaking as Americans, we were involved in that effort to pass the Waxman-Markey bill several years ago. And yeah. when that failed so miserably, I, I, I thought the issue would go away for a generation, yeah. you know, because it was seen as the next BTU tax, which, you know, sort of inflicted uh, Congress for like 20 years. So right. what gives me hope is the issues come back in the U.S. political spectrum. Uh, as uh, quickly as it has, which is, is important because of the urgency of it. What makes me most concerned about is the climate change science, which I'm no expert on. I mean, it's clear that the climate scientists know that something's happened, but they don't know how the Earth is going to react. And really, what makes me most concerned is not knowing how much time we have. Mm -hmm. I mean, how are the oceans actually uh, acidifying? It's a good uh, yeah. So, so. So that's the thing. We're, we're, we're playing a game where we don't know, uh, you know, what's the end of the fourth quarter. That, yeah. And we have to be winning. In other words, we reach a tipping point before we and, and have no time to do anything about it. Exactly. Yeah. Well, in, in my world, the dynamics are pretty good for yeah. us. Um, EPA knows the direction it needs to take. We have a president that's been very clear about that. And we have really quite astounding engagement on that, whether it's from the utilities and the business sector. Um, or whether it's from just the, the general public who's responding to these issues. So I, I couldn't actually be more positive. I think the solutions are before us, and we can make an argument whether you care about the world or the environment or you care about the economy, we can make this work. I think the things that, that concern me most immediately, and they're ones that I think you'll hear from states and, 
in our communities is the question of how do we get resilient because we know that the climate has already changed. Mm -hmm. How do we invest in that infrastructure that we need to keep people safe in a changing climate? We have a lot of efforts underway to try to work with local communities, but uh, people are getting hurt now. Uh, you see agriculture having billions yeah. of dollars in disaster payments. You see California already you know, projecting billions of dollars in losses for that drought. We, we need to not just talk about this globally, but we need to look in our own neighborhoods and keep our families safe. Yeah. And that's going to take a concerted effort. Hmm. Charlie, what gives me hope is, is this uh, giant global coalition that I talked about in the beginning, civil society marching yesterday, mm -hmm. businesses investing right. in this area today, political leaders uh, meeting at the United Nations tomorrow. I believe that we are at the beginning of a new dawn when we talk about climate change solutions and that we've finally made the link between the economy and the environment. The new climate economy report just came out mm -hmm. on the 16th of September. It talks billions of different ways in which we can make that linkage, create jobs, which is what the world needs today. What worries me is how do we scale rapidly? How do we scale rapidly? Because we need not only to reduce our own personal cut footprint, carbon footprint, we need to bring down, pull out of the atmosphere gigatons of carbon. And that requires scale, and velocity. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, let's talk first about uh, what everybody's talking about in terms of, uh, of the conflict with ISIS. Um, how do you see the strategy of the president and the strategy of those in the region, like the and people who uh, were from the Gulf Council and the people who? Um, have tried to come together with a coalition. Is that coalition building? Yes, indeed, and I, I really welcome uh, the American initiative to build uh, such uh, a coalition. It's high time to take military action to stop the advance of ISIL, uh, the so-called Islamic State, which is neither Islamic nor a state. It's a terrorist organization that poses a threat not only to Iraq and the region, but to the whole world. Um, uh, there are a lot of things we want to talk about, but, but uh, I wanted to then go to Ukraine um, and the threat there. I mean, the president seems to have made it clear um, that if, in fact, um, ISIL, uh, that, that, that Russia or um, President Putin decides to move on a NATO state in any way in the Baltics, there'll be a response, and that he should clearly understand that. Yes, indeed. Uh, that was a very clear message from uh, the NATO summit in Wales. Right. Uh, we adopted what we call a readiness action plan, which uh, will mean more visible NATO presence uh, in, in the East. So the Russians know that if they were to attack uh, an ally, uh, they would meet not only troops from that specific ally, but they would meet NATO. Um. But what about Ukraine, which is not a member of NATO? Uh, what is necessary there to send a signal uh, stop? Yeah, obviously, there is a clear difference. Take your troops away. Yeah, uh, obviously, there is a clear difference between being a member of NATO and not being a member of NATO. If you are a member of NATO, you are covered by the famous Article 5, yeah. which states that an attack on one will be considered an attack on all. Uh, so members of NATO are covered by this uh, collective defense uh, and solidarity clause. If you're not a member of NATO, you're not covered by that uh, clause. Um, however, uh, we have uh, decided to step up uh, our uh, military cooperation uh, with uh, Ukraine. At the Wales summit, we took decisions um, that um, uh, will help um, the Ukrainians uh, build their own uh, capability to defend themselves. You will help them. What do they need to, to build that capability? Well, they will... Uh, uh, what, is, uh, what NATO can provide uh, is um, uh, defense capacity building in form of um, 
uh, training activities, advice, assistance, uh, defense reforms. We will invite them to participate uh, more intensively in uh, NATO exercises that will help uh, modernize their military, build their capacity. Mm. In an interesting way, I heard recently two uh, responses about where Putin intends to go. One was that he is simply reacting and he got into a place that was way beyond where he wanted to be. Uh, the argument that after the changes in the government in Ukraine and, and the break off of, uh, of the conversations with NATO, I mean with the European Union, that it was a reactive uh, measure by him uh, and that, that he doesn't like the hand he's playing. The other is that, in fact, it is exactly what he wants to do, hmm. that it is part of something that uh, has concerned him for a long time, is that Russia needs to be surrounded by um, a barrier uh, to the West. I have no doubt that uh, Putin's ambition is to re-establish uh, a, a sphere of Russian influence uh, in the near neighborhoods, in the former Soviet uh, space. Um, as a defensive measure, as a... Yeah, both, I would say, um, but also to prevent uh, countries in Russia's near neighborhood to seek integration with NATO and the European Union. And to that end, uh, it is in Russia's interest to um, fuel um, uh, protracted conflicts uh, in the region. So this goes actually beyond Ukraine. It goes beyond Crimea. It goes beyond eastern Ukraine. It's also about Transnistria uh, in Moldova. It's about Abkhazia and South Ossetia in Georgia, just to mention some of the, the conflicts. Uh, because the Russians calculate uh, that as long as uh, these conflicts are unresolved, uh, NATO and the European Union will be reluctant to import such conflicts uh, into our organizations. So these conflicts serve his interest. Do you think he saw weakness in uh, the actions of the president? Mm, well, uh, actually, I think we have demonstrated unity and, and cohesion. You have seen what I would call an unprecedented uh, unity between uh, the European Union, the US, NATO, G7, I think we have sent a very clear message. But having said that, no doubt that uh, Putin counts on a Western reluctance to really confront him. Um, um, so I have no doubt that uh, continued Russian destabilization, destabilization of uh, Ukraine should be met by broader, deeper, tougher economic sanctions. You also believe that there is a political so solution, do you not? Yeah, but I think the only sustainable long-term solution is a political uh, solution. Mm -hmm. There's no military. And what would be the outlines of that? Well, first of all, let me stress that uh, it's for the Ukrainians to decide yeah. uh, what should be the long-term solution without outside uh, interference. Um, and in that respect, I welcome uh, that uh, President Poroshenko uh, has uh, presented uh, proposals uh, to uh, reform uh, the Ukrainian society with a view uh, to decentralize uh, powers and give more influence uh, to the regions, as requested. Uh, by uh, some of, of the eastern uh, regions. So I, I think the, the current political leadership in, in Kiev has done a lot uh, to find a peaceful and political solution. And you think Putin is prepared for that? Or will have to be coerced into that because of the impact of sanctions? Let me be very frank with you. Uh, President Putin plays a double game. Uh, on the one hand, some occasionally accommodating statements and actions. Sometimes you see uh, a, a withdrawal of Russian troops. Then afterwards, you see a build-up of Russian troops, uh, all with the aim to uh, to confuse uh, the public uh, in 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 Western countries. And there's also a clear pattern. Uh, whenever 
uh, we, we have meetings or are going to have meetings that could, that could result in tougher sanctions, then Putin uh, yeah. tactically um, <coughs> uh, makes some, uh, yeah. some moves. So it's all a double game. So while um, issuing accommodating statements, then with the other hand, they continue destabilizing Ukraine. It's almost three steps forward and two backwards, and in that case, you're gaining. Yeah, I think it's, it's even not three f forward, uh, it's less. Yes. So it's really, um, I, 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 I am very much concerned. Uh, this is really a dramatically changed security situation uh, in, in Europe. We have spent more than 20 years to build a constructive partnership with Russia since the end of, of the Cold War. I think we did the right <coughs> thing. I would say we had a generational obligation to try and uh, use the new situation after the Cold War to build a constructive uh, relationship with Russia. But clearly today, um, Russia considers us not a partner, but an adversary. And of course, we will have to adapt to that. And you're adapting it in one way by this new uh, rapid response force. Tell us about that. Yeah, it's a spearhead force uh, that can be deployed very rapidly. Within a very, very few days, it can be deployed to um, an ally uh, that has been uh, attacked or threatened uh, by a potential uh, aggressor. Um, uh, in order to be able to receive such uh, reinforcements um, uh, quickly, uh, we will have to, to, um, uh, to prepare reception facilities. Uh, so, uh, pre-position pre um, equipment and supplies, prepare necessary uh, infrastructure, including bases and ports. Um, um, so, you will see more visible NATO presence uh, in, in the East. Has the crisis uh, reminded us of why NATO was created in the first place? Uh, and because there was a sense before this crisis that what's NATO doing? Uh, and all of a sudden, they, there is a almost demand that NATO uh, show what it's about. Yeah. Clearly, the question has changed from why NATO to more NATO. Exactly. How more NATO? Um, and uh, I, I think uh, it has become very clear uh, to everybody uh, why we still need uh, NATO. Uh, now um, uh, we are faced with a completely new security uh, situation in the East because of Russia's illegal military actions. But you see, uh, you see, I would call it an arc of crisis surrounding uh, NATO, not only to the East, but also to the Southeast and to, to the South, even from cyberspace. Um, so for all these reasons, uh, we need a very strong uh, collective defense. And um, this is also the reason why we need to invest more uh, in security uh, and, and defense. During the last five years, the Russians have increased their defense spending by 50%, while NATO allies in average have decreased defense spending by 20%. Obviously, that's not sustainable. Mm. So now we need to reverse the trend. What would be for NATO an acceptable um, Russian influence in Ukraine? Yeah, but I, I wouldn't accept. There's nothing that would be acceptable no, I, in terms I mean, of it, Russian influence, even though they have a long history? Yeah, but it, I it, mean, it, why couldn't uh, Russia and Ukraine live side by side in, in, in peace and harmony um, and let the Ukrainians decide? What is the future of their country? It's not for the Russians. It's, n it's not for us. It's for the Ukrainians to decide, and we should respect that. And if they decide they want to be a member of NATO? Yeah, of course. Uh, then make application and see what happens? Yeah, yeah then we will deal with that uh, as we deal with all other um, applicant countries. Let me remind you, by the way, that back in 2008, at the NATO summit in Bucharest, we made a decision that Ukraine and also Georgia will become member of NATO. Of course, provided right. they so wish and provided they fulfill the necessary criteria. That Scared Putin to death. 
I mean, that was a bad day for Vladimir Putin. <laughs> yeah, I think uh, he didn't like it. Um, <laughs> um, and unfortunately, uh, he um, then invaded uh, Georgia in August uh, 2008. You've said this about him, and this may have been when you were Prime Minister of Denmark, but you said, my bottom line is that you shouldn't underestimate Putin's determination. He has a clear goal, he has a clear strategy, he has clear tactics. To match that, you need a firm stance and strong determination. Yeah, I think I said it as Prime Minister, also as Secretary right. General, so I haven't and, changed my okay. mind. Okay, my question is, is it there, a strong will and determination? Yes, both. And better take seriously what uh, Put Mr. Putin says, because he has demonstrated uh, that he does what he says. And NATO, in your judgment, is more relevant than ever? Yeah, it's been relevant all the way through. Uh, but now it's become very clear to everybody why we need NATO. Thank you for joining us. Pleasure to have you here.